All right, we are on to another video for the Nutrition for Food Technology course at Niagara College. And today we're going to talk about the fact that we don't have a textbook. <laughs> a few people reached out and said, so when are we going to find out what textbook we're using in this course? Well, you're actually quite fortunate in that you don't have to go and spend money. However, there is an extensive uh, resource guide on the internet called the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, and it is published by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And it actually isn't a textbook, it is a website. And I don't want people to print it off, I want people to gain the skills and be prepared to access this guide because like many pieces of um, regulation, it changes as the different regula reg regulations and different interpretations change, it changes. And I want you to have the skills to be able to go and research within this document quite frequently, especially about topics related to nutrition and labeling. But uh, just start to get that level of comfort that you can go in and dig and dig a little bit deeper or triangulate and find the answers that you need within the regulations. So today, at the end of this video, you will be able to discuss the role of regulations to safeguard the well-being of Canadians and discuss the role of regulations to provide clear expectation for food manufacturers. And we'll find some key information found in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. So you're taking the Nutrition for Food Technology course. And for those of you who are uh, in the food science program, you know that one of the key roles that food scientists play is helping identify the quality of food products and representing that as part of the advertising and label claims on that product. And so the nutrition facts table is a key piece of that puzzle. And there is a lot of chemistry involved in this, and there's a lot of regulation involved in this. How this whole thing is expressed, there's, a, there's an awful lot of information in here that is important for consumers. It's important for manufacturers. And just uh, if you take a look at a product, I, I pulled up this vector cereal because it's got a lot of key pieces of information on it. But uh, just right there, you see, well, wait a second, there's stuff that's in French. Well, that's a regulation. We see it being labeled as vector, but it is vector. What on earth is vector if you just read it? Well, if you read this fine print down here, they're calling it a meal replacement, substitut de repas. So it is something that is replacing a meal. It's not actually breakfast cereal, but that's important to note. We see a net weight on this product. We see a calorie count on that product. We see a nutrition facts table that's kind of obscured here. We see a negative statement about the content of that product. We see a calorie content. We see some nutrition claims. So 20 grams of whole grains, 13 grams of protein, 22 uh, vitamins and minerals in this product. Each of those pieces of information has a regulatory purpose and we're going to delve into that as part of this course, just digging to um, understanding and interpreting the regulations so that if you're a product developer, let's say, let's say um, a little bit of the story about Vector Cereal, they wanted to have a product that fulfilled that meal replacement. And cereal oftentimes is used as a quick meal. Vector and the folks at Kellogg's wanted to have a product that had a much more complete nutrition declaration and therefore they wanted to see a really high value of protein and be able to um, represent this as a meal replacement for sports recovery. They wanted to have a really um, robust mineral fortification within that product so that people would see it as an incredibly uh, complete product and they wanted to have a lot of whole grains, a lot of fiber, and just see it as a complete meal rather than as a cereal. And so they, they studied the regulations. And as such, because it is classified as a meal replacement, they can, they can advertise it and um, move it within different circles. Uh, uh, marketing and product development all linked together along with the regulatory for being able to present this product properly. And so... So many times I, I teach this course and students say, well, I don't want to worry about the regulations. Someone else will worry about this. No, I am not separating the two apart. If you're a product developer, you need to understand the regulatory principles because you can make the 
the world's best tasting product, but if you can't meet the regulations, then there's no point. Likewise, so many times product developers are in with the marketing team as part of their organization. They're part of the, they're part of the innovation group, and that often links um, marketing and advertising within it. And oftentimes, the marketers will go out and say, well, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could make something that had all of these wonderful features? You as a, as a product developer and as a food specialist need to understand what are the regulations so you know what's possible, what's not possible, and what's the gray area in between that you can innovate on. At a later point, you'll take a course in regulations and you'll find out how to push the boundaries and do marketing authorizations and change the regulations. But uh, just a box of cereal, you didn't realize just how many rules were going on with that. So why do we have all of these rules? Well, we want to have clear labeling expectations for consumers and in particular related to nutrition, we want them to be able to choose foods based on their health and dietary needs. We want them to be able to make comparisons across similar products. So if I'm picking up a box of cornflakes versus Vector, can I make a decision about why I would choose this based off of nutrition or health? And in some cases, all this nutrition information is important for clinical health outcomes. So for example, some people require a low sodium diet for kidney disease or cardiovascular disease. Some people may be avoiding saturated fat because of cardiovascular disease or um, there's different there's different clinical outcomes that people can have um, that require studying of that nutrition information. And so it it is important for us to do this for consumers. It's also important for us as an industry in that we are representing our products in a factual manner. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about trends and how oftentimes um, within the popular media, they'll go on and on about food products um, having all of these wonderful health promoting attributes. But as food manufacturers, we have to be very careful that we, we in many cases, can't go out and jump on that Sam Bayon wagon and represent our food products as preventing disease or um, preventing chronic health issues. We can't be fraudulent and we can't misrepresent what our food products can and can't do. And as you know, most food products really don't have any magic behind them. Um, they provide calories, they provide nutrients, they... In, it, it is it is kind of magical that, that we get so much from our food, but at the same time, we can't go out and ascribe all sorts of wonderful health benefits unless we have the science and the regulations to back us up. So we need that level of transparency about what we can and can't say about our food products. And having regulations means that we have an even playing field. We know what the rules are. We know what we can do. We know what we can't do. And we know if we go and break the rules, what sorts of penalties will be in there. And that provides equity for food companies so that they know what they're getting into and have clear expectations. The thing is, so many food companies, especially small startups, don't realize all of this. And there have been lots of times where small startups will, will, will uh, reach out to me and say, hey, how, uh, talk to me about nutrition labeling. And I'll open up their website, website and say, oh, wait a second, you can't say most of the stuff that you're saying about your products like banana peels cure hiccups and um, banana cream pie will... Uh, relieve depression because it's it's wonderful. You can't you can't do that. <laughs> we'll dig more into how to make substantiated health claims at a later point in a in a in a different video series. But main thing is you have to know what you can and can't say about your food products, and that's what the regulations really are there for. So oh, this is not the end of my slideshow. I'm not going to edit this out. I'm actually going to go jump and straight into not the org chart for Niagara College and not this funding program, but let's jump out here and I'm actually, let's just do it straight up. Google. Let's get Google. I, and I'm going to jump in here on the search engine and I'm going to type in guide to food labeling for industry. You can see how often I type it into my computer. Um, I will leave the link for the guide to food labeling for industry in the YouTube video, but I almost always Google it every single time because the the in in the 
15, 20 years I've been in the industry, the name of this document has changed. And fortunately, if I type in the old name, <laughs> I can get the new one. As with so many laws and regulations, they change over time. And the thing is, I've gotten used to a pattern of being able to look it up fresh every single time. I do not print this off and keep it in a manual. I need to look it up new every time because it changes. So food labeling for industry, there are some nice things. There are some search tools that are available to you. There are some general rules about food products that do require labels. Some food products don't require labels. Think fresh fruits and vegetables or um, in general, it's fresh fruits fresh fruits and vegetables. There are some general fact sheets and uh, infographics, and we can dive into some of these core labeling requirements that are down here. So we mentioned bilingual labeling. If I click on this button here, bilingual labeling, now I've got, here's the general requirements. I can click on complete text here. I can scroll through the whole thing. So general requirements, consumer packaged goods, have to be shown in French and English with the common name and prescribed words. We mentioned before vector cereal. Vector doesn't mean anything. It's a, it's a brand name, but the common name was meal replacement in this case. We have the name of the business. We have the common name of certain products. And in some cases we have to have the standardized name and and so on. I don't want to dig into every single piece of this document right now, but what I want to do is encourage you as a student in the, the food technology course is to jump in and just start reading. There's um, The more you read, the more you learn. The more you learn, the more you have the capability of making decisions about the products that you're working on. So I am going to have some more follow-up videos in a moment because we're going to dig into this tab in particular, nutrition labeling, and start to generate some nutrition labels for food products. So my biggest outcome is you know where to find this website. I want you to have some fun, and I say fun with a big huge asterisk because it should be fun. Start digging into it, start reading up, um, just um, do some problem solving. Perhaps as you're eating a food product and you've got that box or packet in front of you, Take a look at some of the information that's on there and see if you can cross-reference it to some of these tabs, like uh, the name and principal pace of business. Can you find that on your package? Um, on every on every package, it should have the name of the company that made it and where it's where its principal business is. If you're looking on there, what's the net quantity on that product? Take a look. There's all sorts of different. Uh, characteristics that you can find on that food package and you will find it in this guide along with all sorts of different guidance about what's in there. Oh, maybe you want to slide down here. There is a whole section on claims and statements and again, folks who are in the Nutrition for Food Technology course, we will dig into a lot more of this into some next videos. Um, and then there are some uh, commodity specific food labeling requirements. So maybe I'm in the, I don't know, the dairy industry. There's a section just on specifics for dairy products and all sorts of different unique, um, unique attributes specific to the labeling of dairy. So have some fun and I will talk to you again in a few minutes on the next video, which will be more about nutrition facts labeling. Thanks and we'll see you soon.